Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the great Teddy Atlas and top handicapper now in the uh, sport of boxing. Fresh off the fights last night at Madison Square Garden. It's Sunday morning. We're here in our Manhattan studio. Teddy, good to be with you. Yeah, good to be with you, Ken. And uh, you guys out there, hopefully you were paying attention. <laughs> Listen, it's we hate to beat our chest because but we could beat it. We can pat ourselves just a little bit that we got them right. And, um, you know, because you don't always get them right, but we've been doing pretty good, quite frankly, with our percentages of uh, wins. We've been pretty much on the money, and um, fortunately. And if you paid attention, you listened to us, and you ran to my bookie, you can have an extra special Christmas. I certainly did. I had uh, Lopez by knockout which was plus 350, and I had the under 8.5 in the uh, Crawford fight, which made for a little bit of uh, nervousness towards the end there, but he got him out of there just in time. And we're going to go through all the fights in detail, obviously, but a couple observa observations from the fight. First of all, we literally have the greatest fans. I mean, the people couldn't be nicer when they see me there. It never gets old to me when people recognize me and uh, – couldn't be more complimentary. Uh, awesome cross-section of New York City boxing fans. Thank you to all the fans that stopped by to say hello. Appreciate all of you. Um, Teddy, they love you, needless to say. Um, excellent crowd. I thought that it was, you know, Bob Arum had made some comments about boxing tickets were being coming harder and harder to sell, especially with a guy from uh, Lithuania fighting a guy from Omaha in New York just before Christmas. But... Um, crowd was much more lively than I anticipated it was I mean it wasn't sold out but it was pretty pretty well uh full with the exception of maybe the top bowl of the garden um all the fights were incredible all three of the um the last three fights of the night lived up to all the expectations starting with the um Mick Conlon and Vladimir Nikitin fight um what an awesome fight that was. I think the kid and Nikitin delivered a lot more than what most people expected, especially considering the fact that just earlier this year he had a torn bicep. And from all accounts, I don't think he had much sparring. I don't think he was even able to well, hit Well, we reported that. That's exactly right. And I don't think he was even able to hit a heavy bag until recently. So, I mean, kid fought on all hearts. And hard. it showed, quite frankly. And, you know, we, again, we have that light for a reason, to see us and – for us to show you everything that we see and um, everything to cover it all. And I think it showed his lack of conditioning uh, popped up a little bit. Nikita and, of course, the Russian is who I'm talking about, uh, piggybacking off of what you just said, that in the later rounds, that lack of sparring, that lack of being able to do things with two healthy hands in training camp the way you're supposed to be getting ready for such a monumental fight for his career, such an important fight. I think all of that showed. Yeah, And not to mention that he had only three pro fights where Colin had 12, and he had never been past six rounds, and Colin been 10 rounds a couple times. So all the things were stacked up. And not to mention, after saying all that, and that's important, everything we just said, and we handicapped it, and we gave you that information going in, at least we tried to. That's our intention, to let you know again, to put the light on everything. Everything, all aspects of what's going on in that ring or what can go on in that ring. Um, but having said all of that, on top of it, there was no way, like I made a joke, that, you know, St. Patrick would come back and crack a judge over the head with a shillelagh well, they, if he dared to vote for anyone other than Conlon, and those scorecards were made up before the fight started. They the were made up last St. Patty's Day. The judge heard you. Two judge, I think two judges gave, uh, gave Nikita in one round. Con that, that's wrong. I mean, we were there. That, I mean, the kid... I like Conlon as the winner, but to say that the kid Nikitin didn't win any rounds or won one round, no. He, he the politics of the it's business. It's crazy. And and we knew it going in. It played out. But Conlon won the fight. But um, And again, I say, you know, I say what I believe. Not to hurt anyone's feelings, not to, you know, to uh, build anyone's uh, feelings, to uh, just to put out everything that should be put out there. And I thought Conlon, I thought his, I thought his performance was the least uh, impressive of everybody. And, and I'm not knocking him. I'm just pointing out a fact. A fact for me. That's all. I don't see him. I know some of the Irish now. They're gonna, you know, 
please, come on. Well, they're, quick disclaimer, they're, they're we, like, a, we like Conlon. Yeah, He's good. Gonna, but and, that kid, Nick Keaton's not a punk. And I'm I mean, half Irish. <laughs> but Keaton's a good fighter. But, you know, Nick Keaton came in there with damaged hands. He's a guy that can't break an egg. Neither one of these guys could really break an egg in a fight. I mean, Conlon pops a little bit more, but very little more. And Nick Keaton can't break an egg. Colin can't squash a grape in a food fight. And, but, you know, he's got more boxing abilities. He's more dimensional yeah. than Nick Keaton. Nick Keaton, that's called as it is. Nick yep. Keaton is a guy that's a one dimensional guy, squared up. Nobody mentioned it, but his feet got so parallel. He gives you so much target to hit. And he, he's got to get in close to do anything. Uh, he was able to do that in spots. Conlon was even able to fight him off on the inside and hold his own on the inside, maybe even get an edge on the inside, even though he had the big advantage on the outside because of his legs, because of his length, because of his you know, quicker hands, his better technique. Uh, Conlon had a big advantage outside, but he could do it inside because his punches were more concise. His punches were shorter, straighter, uh, cleaner. Uh, that yeah, Nikita the, almost the, had like slapping wide yeah, punches on the inside. His technique's not good right. uh, or not great. And again, he's a tough guy. He had a lot of amateur fights. You know, he's a two-time Olympian. He's a bronze medalist from the Olympics. But he was, he's a limited, I mean, he, he's a one-dimensional guy. And going in there with everything against him, the, the things we mentioned already. And Conlon, for me, uh, he did what he had to do. Mm -hmm. He did what he could do. You know, he boxed on the outside for the first half of the fight. Then he took it inside, did whatever he, you know, whatever he kind of wanted in certain spots. Um, but out of the whole card, I didn't walk away saying, hey, let me mark down on my counter when the next time Colin fights. And, and one of my questions is, you know, and I always make notes because I, I want to remind myself of, hitting on the things for you guys that I think you want to hit on. I think, unless you're one of those fanatics, and that's okay, come on, hang out. Come on, <laughs> come on, it's okay. We, we got something for you. We, we, we got something to relax you a little bit and, and understand where you're coming from, but give us something. Give some chance to understand both sides. And my question would be, and we'll go into the fight a little bit more, but my question would be, who can Conlon beat of the top featherways. I mean, he can't beat Santa Cruz. He's not beating Gary Russell Jr. Definitely not Oscar Valdez, who I think might stop him. Not Carl Frampton. Again, I know I'm half Irish. In Conlon's but, defense, he no. doesn't have a ton of pro fights, but but, yeah, but I, I neither mean, did Nikitin. He had three pro fights. He's not going to beat Carl Frampton. Um, he's not beating Shakur Stevenson, who's another top-ranked fighter and another Olympian. He won the silver from the last Olympics. Um, again, I I know people are going to say, oh, yeah, he's got a fan base. Yeah, I understand why he has a fan base. Can they and, get in the ring with him? And yeah, I understand all that. No, they can't. you got to be alone when you get in the ring. But when one of the things for to break the fight down – I saw Nikitin, his one chance was to be aggressive. He's a one-dimensional guy. He's a tough guy. He can't punch, but he throws a lot of punches. He's going to be aggressive. But again, you saw the lack of preparation, maybe mentally and physically, the lack of being able to get the right sparring because of his hand problem and his arm problem because he really wasn't, he wasn't really doing the things. It was a little bit of an illusion. Uh, optical illusion. What I'm going to say by that is nobody pointed out that Nikitin, for all the talk and fanfare about you know how he's had to be busy, he was going to be busy, he was going to be coming, and he looked to me like a guy warming his car up in the driveway, burning rubber in neutral, never getting out of the freaking driveway. He never got on the road. Yep. I mean, stop the please don't con me when when I'm watching a fight. I know what I'm watching. The guy was wasting a lot of movement, and but he wasn't going nowhere. He was burning. The only thing I didn't see was smoke come up, where he was burning rubber. And again, he was in the driveway, in neutral, revving the engine up. But he wasn't getting 
to the guy. It he wasn't really he bit, wasn't really coming forward. It reminded me a little bit of an amateur or fight. Or doing anything. Where you see the amateurs getting close and it's a point system, so they're just trying to unload a barrage, slapping punches from every angle. Did am I crazy? But he never no, that? you're Did right, you but he that? never but I didn't even see the barrage is coming because there was a lot of motion, 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 but the next part never came. The next part never came. Only in spots, very sporadically. Yeah. Very sporadically. And I think part of that was his lack of preparation. Mentally, I think it affected him. Yeah. Because he couldn't have That's the what confidence. It like. He couldn't have the confidence that he could push it into that gear and let everything go. Because he didn't know if he'd be able to last. Yeah. And I saw it. So what am I supposed to... Oh, I'll close my eyes and I won't say nothing next time, fellas. I don't want to hurt your feelings. So I'll just, I won't see what I see. But I know, what, I know what I saw. And again, some people that are just fanatical fans are going to say, oh, Teddy, you're not giving him credit. No, I'm giving him credit. He did what he had to do with that guy. But he had a lot of advantages with that guy. And I just don't see where you go from here. I, I, you made a good point just now. That's fair. He's got 12 fights. But he had 200, 300 amateur fights. Yeah. So, you know, you're not going to get too much more time. You got to be ready. You got to be ready now. And I know, again, I mentioned it in a prior podcast. And we mentioned things that aren't going to get mentioned other places, quite frankly. Where I know top rank people, they're not thrilled with Conlon's development or lack of. They're not. They're not going to say it. They're not going to say it, you know, because there's, you know, they're selling seats. The Irish fans are going to come. Good, beautiful. I think Conlon was responsible for a lot of the people there. The crowd sure. was on fire for him. I'm sure. And um, But that's what I, I mean, that's what I saw. I, I, I saw a fight, and again, there was only one guy who was going to get that. The judges had it already fixed in their head. 100%. Those scorecards were insane. But and, the and story got completed. You know, he, yeah. he got revenge. Yep. You know, they, the story got completed. He got revenge for his loss in the Olympics. And uh, and then you go forward. Where do you go? Yeah. Well, again, Nikitin with three pro fights, never going past six. Now he's in a 10-round fight against a guy with 12 fights in Madison Square Garden with the feel of almost a main event. It was so electric when he came in there. That's a huge step up. Like you said, it looked everything you said. He he looked nervous. Not not nervous like he's scared, but just anxious. He was getting off punches that were like at odd angles. I think he could have had a slightly better performance had he had time to prepare physically, but also emotionally. It, it just like you said, it looked like it was almost overwhelmed by the moment. But of the three fights, that was probably the least interesting of the three because the next one was... Yeah, I'm gonna, I want to segue into the next one by yeah. getting rid of this one by... I can't help it. You know I love the movie references, <laughs> right? You guys know it by now. And I got to use a reference. Just hit me as you were talking. Um, from my cousin, Vinny. <laughs> uh, I'm through with this guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm through with this guy. Let's uh, that's, that's move on. We're, we're through with this guy. Remember Pesci in court? Yeah, of course. I'm through with him. I'm through with this guy. <laughs> Well, the next fight lived up to all the expectation. And uh, you and I had talked about this extensively via text, even last night during the fight. And I had said, Comey, I think, you know, the, the odds started at two to one. You you gave your opinion. And listen, I'm not going to suggest that we move the line nationally. But I'll tell you that as soon as we talked about that, maybe coincidence, maybe not. It went from around 200 minus 225 to minus 410 in some places right before the fight went off which is why I jumped on Lopez by KO at plus 350. Um, and again, I had said to you like, man, I think Comey at four to one, I would take Comey if I didn't have my bets locked in. And I like Comey personally. He's got a, he's a nice, seems like a nice kid. And when they came into the ring, I was like, all right, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Comey does something here. And my God, did Lopez put on a show. I would have been surprised the, I, because I said it as strongly as I could yeah, say. Yeah, you did. You did. You I, know, and again, it's not, I mean, when we're wrong, we take that too. You know, we we take that side of it too. But if you couldn't get to watch the fight, um, and now I'm jesting with people a little bit, but you know, and showing off a little bit, but in all good fun, uh, actually, because we know how quickly that can change, <laughs> very quickly. And so we're, yeah, we'll be the first to say it when we're, we're wrong we're, too. We're kidding, we're kidding around. But uh, you do watch for a reason, and we try to provide all of those reasons for you for your confidence for your belief in us we really do it means 
means a lot. So um, if you couldn't get to watch, um, you didn't need to. All you had to do was watch or listen to our podcast, and you knew what happened, or you would know what happened. Almost to a, almost to a T. <laughs> because uh, we said that he was going to knock him out early, within three rounds. Yep. I mean, go to the videotape. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, Where's our man Rob? Rob, get the video up. <laughs> Got it. Put on the projector. Here's the clip from last week. When you have a young guy that you think is going to be a star, and you you put him on the biggest stage, you put him Madison Square Garden on ESPN, uh, you want to bring the curtain down. Mm -hmm. I think you'll bring the curtain down. I think there's a good chance you'll bring the curtain down. I'm going to pick Colme by sudden knockout out of the Lopez. blue. Lopez. Uh, Lopez, I'm sorry, to knock out Colme yep. uh, out of the blue in uh, in three rounds. Warner Wolf. Remember Warner Wolf? <laughs> yeah. He was a great uh, sportscaster. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was. He was from Washington originally, moved to New York, became big, big and legendary in New York. And, uh, you know, you go to the videotape. <laughs> so, but we did. We we told you what was going to happen. Uh, I remember what I said. I remember, I think that Lopez will not come out early in the first three rounds and it will be a suddenness to it. You know, a suddenness to it. And and that differentiates the knockout. You know, you could knock a guy out. You could stop a guy. You could break him down. You know, accumulation. But suddenness. There will be a sudden bang. And there was. It was a sudden. You it was know. awesome. I mean, for Lopez and his career and top rank and all the things that go along with it, this was, he delivered And it was the everything. right way to do it because the other thing that uh, when we were describing what we thought was going to happen, I said, this is the moment that you want to bring the curtain down. Yep. I remember using that term. This is the moment, if you're going to do it right, you're, the promotion's there, you're Madison Square Garden, they've been talking about this kid, he's 22 years old. And he was coming that, off a lackluster he's performance. Gonna, he, yeah, he's going to be the next electric sensation. You know, all the things that they, they want him in some ways to be the next Canelo. You know, I was bringing all those things up. Yeah, and yeah. he's going to bring that fan base. Well, here you are, kid. You're on the stage. You're on Broadway. Go out there and be a star. And the crowd was behind him 110%. The people outside were rooting for him. I mean, it was crazy. And and bring the curtain down, and he did. And he did. He did it the way you awesome. want to do it. It was awesome. He did it the way... Uh, and, and listen, I predicted it. What did I predict it from? Well, from my knowledge, from what I see, from Comey. Comey being a good game guy and everything else and give him credit where he comes from. Um Ghana. Yeah, from Ghana and Black other stars. champions have been there. You know, like Azuma Nelson, great professor. I Corte. I I mean, the Colt, uh, some really Cody. Colt, uh, there, there's been a lot of, uh, I mean, in a place with such a minimal uh, amount of people comparatively to have that many top champions come out of there. It's pretty amazing. Some great athletes, yeah. soccer team, the Black Stars, they're awesome. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I like the and, Gunnies. But what I saw in doing my handicapping of the fight was I saw Comey, a guy that had two losses, a guy that didn't have one of the elements going in that Lopez has that he hadn't learned how to lose yet. That's an element that a lot of people don't talk about, uh, psychological element. 75% of this business is psychological. And the other thing, I seen him hurt in a fight. So I knew if he yeah. could be hurt, this guy could take it to the next place. You know, they could take him to that neighborhood. This guy could take it to the the, the interesting thing about that, that is the same way he got knocked out is the same way he got hurt by Easter, which shows the difference in punching power between Easter and Lopez. Oh, that's true. They they hurt the same way. The only difference is Lopez punched. There was no coming back. I mean, he was he was lucky he got up from the first knockdown. See, the, and the positive or the. The elements, the the traits, the abilities of of Lopez that I recognize for myself is that he's got quick hands, he's got power, but he's got quick movements. He's an athlete. He's got quick movements and quick feet. Yep. And, and I made the comparison. I said, don't get crazy because I'm getting a little nuts here making it because it's not time for that yet. He's got a long, long, long way to go. But I made a little bit of comparison of Pacquiao mm -hmm. because Pacquiao, everyone saw the explosion of when he hit you, but what got it there? What was the delivery? His quickness, his feet, his his ability to close that gap bang, real quick and and you know deliver that that missile, deliver that bomb. And I saw those same abilities 
uh, in Lopez, and I saw, a, I thought, a perfect storm for him of a guy that he could deliver those abilities, that he could explode those abilities on the stage. And we got that one right. And I want to also give credit to his manager, Dave McWaters, because Dave McWaters is, is one of the rarities in his business. I don't know if anyone told you yet, Ken. There's not a million good guys in a business. Oh, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone told me. Having don't, spent don't. eight weeks in camp with you and been yeah. ex exposed to some of the elements of boxing. He's one of the good guys. He's he's one of the good ones. He's one of the good who actually cares about the fighter, actually cares about how he, what he does mm -hmm. and how he does it. Mm -hmm. And he did a great job getting Lopez to this place. Tremendous job. Really, he's got I other agree. fighters too. And... He, I'm just happy to see one of the good guys, one of the good guys, you know, uh, get what he earned and mm -hmm. what he deserved. So I'm, I'm happy for that. And I, I, again, it was just, uh, it was what we expected to happen. A complete um, athletic performance. And the one thing I noticed, and tell me what you think, when they, on the first knockdown, they both threw, um, I believe it was a looping right, hands and the difference was lopez got there a touch quicker a touch stronger and right on the button and comey's just missed a little wide a little slower and my god what a difference in those two punches i mean when lopez, and you know i'm when gonna add comey went down he was on queer street see what you just you described to the people out there i'm gonna add one other attribute um ability that doesn't always get talked about but it's part of what you just described. He has good eyes. Mm. Good eyes. The real good ones have good eyes. And he's calm enough and he's concentrated enough, focused enough, lasered enough with his eyes. With his eyes, it's kind of like if you deliver a missile and it's got a laser system. The laser system going to get it there more accurately, quicker. Just a pinpoint second quicker than without the laser system, oh, yeah. right? That's exactly he's, what it looked like. He's got the laser system, you know, to be able to cut right through that. Mm -hmm. And and you made a good point, uh, the athleticism, you know, to back it up. Anytime you can do a standing backflip, and I can tell you, like, growing up in Brooklyn, I'm sure that um, Tia Fimo wasn't going to, like, little kids' gymnastics classes. That's just pure athleticism where he probably one day was like, I bet you I can do a backflip, which... Anyone who's ever tried that probably realizes that it's not quite that easy. So just just the display of athleticism after the fight is like, man, you can't teach that. So when you have all those elements and then you have the right people around you, like you described with the manager making sure he's being looked after the right way, I just hope with all the distractions he has outside of the ring with the dad and his, the new wife and the family's not getting along, that someone is big enough to step in and say, listen, this is, we're at critical moment right now. Well, you Everyone know that, needs to put the crap aside well, you know and who let's that's, get business. You know who that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Again, here we are, you know, um, trying to put light on all of it. Not just the obvious. The obvious is the obvious. Anyone could do that, you know? Yeah, you could, you could get, you know, a lot of people do that. But you know who that guy is? That guy is the fighter. Mm -hmm. And he's already started to do a little bit of that. Yeah. By bringing, and, and the manager too. The manager has to oversee that, and the manager has to influence some of that and suggest some of that. That's his job. And he does. And But the fighter, the fighter, he's the guy. It's his future. You know, you, you can't put it back in a bottle once it's gone. You have a future, you know? And you get one shot at this for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes people reinvent themselves, but. Uh, Very you, rarely. But you, you got you to gotta get it right. And so it comes on to the shoulders of the person. And the fighter has already taken that step. He brought Joey Gamash in. Mm -hmm. Joey Gamash is, uh, is a good, he's, he's a guy that I trained. We talked about this before. I trained him at the end of his career yeah. and, and he was around me. And uh, he's, uh, I think he, he took in a lot from, from that and from his experiences. And he's a, He's a good teacher. Did a great job with Otto Wallen against yeah. Tyson Fury. Really good. Yeah. And he's and Wallen's not a talented guy. You know, he's just a I mean a gritty guy, give him credit for that, but not a physically talented guy like a Lopez is. But I think Lopez Joey Gamach got but, every ounce no, of talent. No, he did, and that's why I thought that fight 
go into that fight. I called that fight to go the distance. Yeah, no, you were right on the money and, with and, that. And you gave it to credit to Gamage. And going said that before. was the difference. Yeah, yeah. B- before. Yep. I mean, afterwards, you no, could exactly. say. No, exactly. Because Gamage, I knew that he would have him ready. I knew that he would technically, fundamentally cross the T's, dot the I's. Yep. And, and he ha- does. And have and, a and real that's game a, plan. That, that's a real trainer. Yeah. That's a real trainer. The teaching component. Not just the conditioning component. The teaching component. And uh, so the fighter wanted somebody else in there to help, you know, with everything going on. And I, he put his feet down, and he and he got somebody in there. Mm-hmm. And Gamash, you know, and moving forward, you'll see how much Gamash is, you know, able to do with obviously having to step aside for the father, and, and the father's going to, you know, step over him, and the father's going to have first say in the – the father's not going to want to be overshadowed. The father and, wants uh, to be the star of the show. Yeah. Nothing pisses me off more than when oh. the dad is living vicariously through his children. Dude, you had your chance. You're not the champ. Be in the background. And a good example of right and wrong, Lopez's dad is all up in the camera, in the business all the time. Look at uh, Lomachenko's dad. Uh, the, the, the boxing super fan knows who he is. But I'll bet you most people don't even realize that Lomachenko's dad is the trainer outside of the super fans. And another example is Danny Garcia's dad. Everyone knows who is Danny Garcia's dad because he's always a, like has to be well, one thing ever is, present. I get what you're saying, but you gotta give him credit. They get they have been successful with their sons. It, it, That's one thing. No, yeah, no, but I mean those I'm kids just saying, are super talents. But 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 you don't know. You haven't been there to see the path and the upbringing and all the things before they got to show that they have this talent, the development. All, all those years, you know, taking kids to amateur fights. Yeah, that's no, fair. No, no different than than the stories you hear in football, where uh, the father was getting up at five in the morning and taking the kid to practice, or taking them to different uh, places where you know, whether it was ice skating, taking them to ice skating rinks, or or whether it was uh, baseball, taking them to the batting cage in the middle of December. Yeah, no, no very uh, fair, very fair. I just wish they wouldn't be like. Swing, screaming and yelling at the press conferences. It's almost like like Rex Ryan in football where he's like screaming and telling you, we're going to hit you. You're not going to get in there. Stop talking like that. Just let the kid do his thing. I don't I'm know. I'm just, just saying that, that, right. that the, these you're fathers right. did have a lot to do with them. And, and they, from an emotional standpoint, a mental standpoint, they give them confidence. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of their confidence is connected with their, their father's beliefs. Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, so they've done, They you can't take away the, the part they've had You're right. in the success. Now, from there, let's talk about the future now because that's where we are. We, yeah. We're at the future. And it's funny to use the word future in a powerful way with a 22-year-old kid. He's 22 years old. It's crazy to think he, about. He, he's 22. So here's the thing. You know, you, you know Top Rank, the promoter, of course, they want to move Lopez into a monumental fight, into a huge fight with Lomachenko. And maybe a record, and and Rob can do the fact-checking for me on this. I think it might be a record if they fight Lomachenko to be for four titles, and that might be the first time or one of the rare times where four belts are on the line. You know, it, in other words, it's going to be a, something you can talk about. It's, yeah. it's, it's going to be something big. Like Ruiz uh, and not, I don't uh, know Joshua it, was yeah. four belts. But it's very rare. Yeah, there's not a lot of them. I think it's four belts. And I think the, Progress Taylor might have had four because they had the Ring Magazine and, and, WBC. And I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if Crawford had four when he fought. Uh, who was the guy from Africa that he fought? And he stopped him. He was undefeated. I did the fight, actually, on, on ESPN. I did the broadcast of the fight. But... I think there's some something, I'm not going to say historic, but there's something in this fight with the amount of belts on the line um, that would make, and, and also one of, one of the guys being 22 years old, that's another element to it, but makes the fight a little bit... Ndongu? Yeah, Ndongu was the guy. I, I Julius Ndongu. Yeah, I thought the, there was four uh, belts. Was there four super belts? Super lightweight, yeah. You had the WBC, WBA, IBF. WBO, yeah. So knocked them out. 
There's not a million of them have four. I, I thought there was another element there. Uh, Robert looked for it, but I thought there was another element that they're going to put out there for promotional reasons when they, if they do make the fight with Lopez and Lomachenko to beat the drums on a fight, you know, to, to make the, to build the fight. I think there is something there that they're going to uh, kind of throw into the. Maybe Ring Magazine? I mean, I think if hey, those two I fight, wonder, Ring Magazine has yeah, to be on the I line. I wonder if that's it too. So is that make it five? I, I just think there's something there that I know that they're going to put out there from a promotional standpoint to say, hey, this this doesn't happen too often. But having said that, the future. So they're looking to move that fight, uh, him into that fight. There's a couple of ways to go with this. One is to say, hey, he's 22 years old. He can punch like a son of a gun. Punches are born and are made. He's got that natural power. He's natural. Are there some advantages over Lomachenko? Well, he's 22 years old. He's 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 a naturally bigger guy. Lomachenko has moved up three weight classes now, right? And he's the naturally physically stronger guy. And so you could say that and say, okay, you know, can you imagine going in this fight? Uh, and if he, you could also look at it, even if he loses the fight, if he loses competitively, you know, he is still, he is still marked, put a flag in the ground. Not unlike Canelo's loss to uh, Mayweather. Yeah, he's put a flag in the ground, you know, and, and he's still obviously got a lot of road uh, to move up on and, and to rumble and ramble uh, down that road and, and still be all the things they want him to be. But you can also look at the other one way, and I'm pushing towards that right now as I'm doing this broadcast, that it's too soon to put him in with a guy like Loman I'm with you. That it's I'm too soon. You. That he's not experienced enough. He's not ready. Yeah, he's got power. So guess what? I got news for you. Lomachenko makes a living out of dismantling guys with power and with ability and that are aggressive and that are, you know, that have all those kind of abilities. He he puts them up on his wall like heads, like like pelts. <laughs> People <laughs> like, in boxing have a short memory, meaning Lopez just fought. Oh my God, he is unbelievable. Of course, he can beat Lomachenko, but they forget all the three three opponents in a row that Lomachenko literally world class undefeated fighters that he made quit on the stool. He's like the That's predator. Hey, of. the predator. You know, they they take the skulls. I know there's a little, but but they polish it off, and a yeah. guy polishes it, and he's got all his skulls on his on his on his necklace. You know, all the trophies. Uh, Lomachenko makes trophies out of men. I, I'm with you. I think it's too soon for Teofimo Lopez to beat Loma. That being said, that fight, they could put that fight anywhere. I'd even consider going to Saudi Arabia to watch it. The money, who knows? Maybe some <laughs> sheik over there is going to put up money like they put up $50 million or whatever the number was. It was somewhere in that neighborhood. They put up for the Ruiz and Joshua fight. I think it was somewhere around $50 million. Yeah. But again... For me, so you gotta you gotta make your your decision. I know the father and everyone they're gonna say, hey, my kid could beat anyone, and he's looking for, to make history, and he's 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 done a good job. And I'm not taking nothing away from him. I'm just offering my opinion. My opinion is that I would go a little bit down the road, a road that has been traveled before. There is a precedent for what I'm thinking. I go down the road of Canelo, where Canelo. Everyone wanted to see him with Triple G. They waited. They waited for Triple G. People forget already. Mm -hmm. They waited for Triple G to get older. They waited for him to get older, and then they said, okay, now, let's pounce. Let's go. And they went, and I thought he lost the first fight. I thought he lost both fights. But, hey, it turned out the way it turned out. He was able to. Now it was the right time, where maybe earlier, two years earlier, it would have been the wrong time. The one thing that can sabotage or push Momonchenko's train off the track is uh, something that can do it to anybody. Mm -hmm. The father of time putting his shadow on you, you know, uh, just starting to touch you a little bit. And I, listen, I don't have to explain to anyone how much I back Lomachenko. I had him on my pound for pound list as 10 best pound for pound fighters after his first pro fight. Mm -hmm. And I got criticism for it at the time. And I'm saying I'm seeing a little bit, just a little bit of father time starting to 
just just put his finger on him. Mm-hmm. Just just a little bit. Kind of like a little touch. You ever touch? I know you got that nice sweatshirt on. It's nice. <laughs> but do you, you ever feel the little touch of the autumn air, the autumn wind, mm-hmm. where it just tells you summer's going to end? Yep. And at the end of summer's coming. It, it's, 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 it just touches you. It just nudges you just a little bit. And you feel it and you say, oh, gee, mm-hmm. maybe the summer's going to end. And I'm not saying the summer is ending yet for Lomachenko. I'm just saying that that autumn wind touched just a little bit. And if they waited a little longer, uh, it would probably be advantageous to Lopez. Well, hopefully for him, that autumn wind isn't followed by an uh, Indian summer day of 95 degrees in September. Lomachenko will bring an Indian summer. (laughs) because At least for the next couple years, I think. Well, the thing with Lomachenko... Lomachenko, he had 400 amateur fights. Uh, so that's where you can start to show a little bit of father time touching you. Mm-hmm. It can start to happen. Mm-hmm. But, of course, he has a style where he doesn't take a lot of punishment. But his last few fights, you could argue that he's being touched a little bit more. Yeah, 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 I, I, a little bit. And that could be the thinking with the father and with Lopez is that if I could touch him, I can win if I could touch him clean. And but for me, Lomachenko is the guy that he's the surgeon that takes these guys apart. Yeah. He doesn't care about power, he doesn't care about speed, he doesn't care about, you know, uh youth, he doesn't care. He he goes systematically and takes people apart. He starts with the physical part. Of doing that, and then he he takes out a scalpel, a special scalpel, <laughs> to remove the emotional part, the will of you, to start to pull that out of you, to start to to just remove that 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 component from you, where you no longer have that will. He's like that kung fu guy in the kung fu movies, like yeah, and he goes right through your chest and. And then you look and the heart's there. And he pulls the heart out. <laughs> and the body's still standing there for a split second. It's still standing there before it realizes, oh, I got no heart. <laughs> and it just falls. Which reminds me a little bit of the guy in the main event last night. Whereas he takes his time, breaks you down, figures it out. You think the opponent's having a few moments of um, a few flashes of greatness. Oh, it looks susceptible. And then someone like Terrence Crawford just starts to slowly pick them apart, exactly the way you just described. Crawford, so we're going to go to Crawford fight now. And I think we're done with the, we covered everything we can with the second fight with, you know, with uh, Lopez. Uh, terrific, terrific. I mean, brought the, you know, went out on Broadway and said, hey, I'm here. I don't think he could have done a better job than he did, Lopez. And uh, Lomachenko and his father are too smart to let this fight wait too long. Um, You know, they hold the keys. You know, as much as Lopez feels good in the father, you know, says all the things he does, it's great. But there's one guy holding the keys to this car. Uh, Not Lopez. Not yet. Not yet. Um, And if Lopez wants to get a ride in it, uh, it's probably going to have to be now. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Lomachenko isn't waiting for them uh, to grow old. And I get a kick. I'll finish with this. I get a kick out of Lomachenko. Lomachenko, he has the persona, just like Crawford. He has the confidence. He has everything. Yep. Everything. And and it just exudes from him. I hope you guys even saw what I saw. I, I laughed. And I text my son, and he laughed right back. Because that's Lomachenko. You, you got to love it. Mm-hmm. Because he backs up everything that, that you know him to be, you want him to be. Yeah. Backs it all up. Because when the, when the commentator, I think it was Bernardo, um, the sideline reporter, went up to him and said, and tried to get a little something out of him, you know, yeah, doing yeah. that job, and said, so Loma, uh, you know, Lopez had, had been talking a lot. His father had been calling you out and been saying a lot of things a few months ago. And you famously said, 
who is Lopez? <laughs> the uh, best answer. Yeah, and and oh my God, it was so great. And he goes, what do you, uh, he said, now he's a world champion. He just won a world title. And what do you say now? And without even blinking, Lomachenko says, welcome to my club. <laughs> I see you in April. <laughs> I mean, really, you got to love it, right? Yeah. Even if you're not a fan of his, he says just what that guy would say. Mm -hmm. The real deal. That was just such a, I, I got to repeat it again. It was great. It was just, he's, uh, what do you say to him? Welcome to my club. <laughs> I see you in April. <laughs> there it is. I'll tell you, that's going to be, that is a, that is an exciting fight and i know a lot of people are going to be anticipating that one with the right promotion they should be able to do some big numbers with their um the problem for top rank is if you kill off um you know one of them you know where does i mean i don't know i just go to the coffin yeah that again uh i was shocked at how many um fans were out in force for um Cavalaskis. Um, I'm going to call him Mean Machine because it's easier to pronounce, but um, he had a huge Lithuanian uh, contingency there. We bumped into an uh, old friend of yours, uh, young Al from Agus' uh, former assistant. Oh, Al was Agus there? Agus yeah, yeah, was there with his uh, Lithuanian friends. They were all there in force. I mean, I was- He's a good I, guy, Al. Oh, good the nicest, the nicest. And um, man, that kid, Mean Machine, came out. I mean, after that controversial draw- which I thought he lost to Ray Robinson on an, on an undercard in a small venue in Philly. I really expected to Crawford. I expected Crawford to blow him out of here so fast. Um, and Mean Machine came to fight. And, you know, to his credit, he really uh, put on a good show for the first, let's call it, four or five rounds. But you could see Crawford slowly starting to figure him out. And Mean Machine had some moments and landed some decent shots. But like a master Crawford absorbed them completely unfazed I was I was impressed with how many shots Crawford took and didn't seem to be phased I do think that and you could tell me what you think I think that they robbed Mean Machine of a knockdown I thought he did score a knockdown I don't know if it was the second or third round but he landed a bunch of punches Crawford tried to clinch with them and eventually went down they ruled it a slip I thought it was a knockdown even on the replay you could tell me what you think but um incredibly entertaining fight and Crawford showed why he's has a case to be the number one pound for pound fighter because listen me machines not he, this is an undefeated legit fighter and Crawford just took him apart he just took a little bit longer than I think most people thought he would not you you said exactly what would happen that he'd stop him in the middle rounds middle to late rounds so tell me what you saw and uh, specifically what you think of the uh, knockdown slash uh, slip yeah, I mean, I didn't focus on it enough. It, it could have probably been a knockdown. I, I didn't focus on it enough, but it showed, this fight showed all the special qualities of why Crawford, depending on, between him and Lomachenko, is either number one or number two in the world, depending on your taste. Mm -hmm. You know, what, your taste is in fighters. Um, ice cream. Do you like it with sprinkles or without sprinkles? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, either way, it's ice cream, baby. Mm -hmm. Ice cream's good. <laughs> and, and so Lomachenko or Crawford, either, what do you like better? That uh, You know, Lomachenko is the guy that's technically so superior to everybody out there. Uh, he's got that supreme belief, that supreme confidence, just like Crawford. And he's uh, he's going to be aggressive. He's going to walk in the rain without getting wet, mm -hmm. you know. And he's going to be aggressive without you being able to find them the way you want to find them. He's going to break it down. He's going to show all kinds of trickery, getting to the side, all kinds of smart things. And he's going to put on just a fabulous performance of technique, steadiness, you know, dependability. Or do you like Crawford? Power. Power, the ability, very dimensional. The ability that he showed, again, where he could do it on the outside. He could stretch the ring out. He could use his great length. He could counter punch, set traps, or he could go get you. Mm -hmm. Go get you. But for me, the thing is with, with Crawford, first of all, the reason why he was competitive was give credit 
to Kav- Kazulovskis mean machine. I'll go the other <laughs> way. I'll go the. I, I'll go the I, it reminds me when I was doing my first Olympics uh, with Marv Albert, the great Marv Albert, probably the greatest basketball announcer of all time, and one of the greatest pure commentators in any sport of all time. I mean, one of the great... And, Up there with and, the great Johnny Most, uh, well, yeah, the Boston I mean, Celtics, well, oh, great. Yeah, well, you had to bring in some, <laughs> someone from Boston. I had to, I'm sorry. But it's okay. No, he was great too. Uh, no doubt about it. But I'm just saying, Marv Albert, anyone who has their own catchphrases that they invented is pretty special and has the longevity that he's had. But my first Olympics was in Sydney and it was with Marv. And I'll tell you, we were doing the fights and some of these guys, their names are impossible. It's just ridiculous, <laughs> you know? So I took the easy way out. I said, I, the guy's name was killing me. So I said, so, you know, the Bulgarian in the blue. And he was like, no. <laughs> Teddy Atlas cannot go that route. You can't say the Bulgarian in the blue. <laughs> no, that, that is beneath you. And I said, all right. <laughs> you know, and I slaughtered the guy. And yeah. I'm sure that it, him and his people would have rather I set the Bulgarian in the blue. <laughs> but Marv was happy. Yeah. All right. So the the mean machine, and he he had at least he had a plan. See, if he would have just came forward, and he would have walked into the sausage grinder, <laughs> he would have. Oh yeah. And but he knew that he didn't have the physical abilities and attributes that Crawford has. But there's ways to to make adjustments. There's ways to counter those things. There's ways to even the playing field. There is. There is. There's so many different ways. And one way is to use timing to negate speed. Use timing to negate aggression. And he did. He stayed patient. He waited. And he looked to time the guy that maybe was going to be a little over anxious early because maybe not really giving him enough credit, maybe overlooking him. I mean, even the great ones can overlook someone. They don't Perfect know, description. They don't overlook them to the point where they're not prepared. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. They don't do that. But they do. They start to think, hey, you know, this guy's not in my league. And they're right. They're right. But so they, he thought he was going to go and, you know, make handiwork of him a little bit. And he's got a little over aggressive, a little careless. Even the great ones make mistakes. And Crawford did. And to the credit of the mean machine, he laid back and he looked to time him. And he was able to. He was able to throw the punches at the right time. For you guys out there trying to become fighters, some of you just, it's not about throwing punches. It's about throwing the right punches at the right time. Hey, I remember when I was asked to train Povetkin. Um, he, we wound up winning the heavyweight title. And they asked me to come to Russia and think about training him. At first I said no, and then my kids talked me into going there and giving it a look. And the first thing that hit me, yeah, he threw a lot of punches. Everyone said, oh, he's a busy guy. He throws a lot. Well, I didn't want him just throwing a lot of punches. Mm-hmm. I wanted him throwing the right punches at the right time. Because sometimes throwing a lot of punches at the wrong time is exactly what your opponent needs. Not you, your opponent. Your opponent needs that. To be able to catch you, to make you available, so that that was kind of uh, Kafeslaskis, the the meme machine, was <laughs> was understanding he had to have a plan, and that he couldn't just go out there and just throw punches. He had to throw them at the right time. And for the and first it, four it, rounds, it gave, he it, was. It kept him in the fight. Perfect. It kept him plan. in the fight. It, Very it, much it, so. And it gave him his moment. Yep. And there's no doubt. And then. He made the mistake, and I'm saying this in, in jest, mm-hmm. but I'm saying this seriously. Really, I, I can't enough say my appreciation for Crawford. This is my way of showing and giving him his due. And one, where, quick, where, one quick thing. During the fight, Rob and I were texting with you because Rob was getting your tweets up, and I'm seeing this and I'm saying, my God, this mean machine is really good. But just to give you an idea of what like a typical, let's say, fan versus like a, a pure boxing mind sees, you said to us right before Crawford start taking, started taking over, we were like, wow, Rob, I think said to you, mean machine looks really good. I'm surprised. And you said, the tide's shifting right now. Crawford's figuring them out. Watch this. And literally, 
this is in between rounds. As soon as you said that was the round before he knocked him down, heading into that round, whatever it was, like the coming in, in between seven and eight maybe. But I was like, son of a bitch, that is exactly what happened. But I didn't see that. And I mean, I'm watching intently. No one was going to speak about it. And I'm like, what does he see? What does he see in that? Crawford seems to be getting timed. Like Mean Machine seems to have a perfect counter plan, a plan of counter punching and timing him just right and was like doing a great job staying in the fight. But anyway, I just wanted to give you that oh, credit. So go ahead. Because a lot of people don't know that. And having been in the camp with you, with Alex, there's just so many things that I can tell you that even most of the announcers don't recognize. But when you hear someone who's so close to the sport and understands everything, like when to throw a punch, where are you finishing the punches? Why did you throw that punch? What are you going to throw off of that? Don't just throw one, two. What's the next plan? Everything is like thought out. And, and to use one of your quotes is like con extreme concentration the entire time. There's no wasted movement. There's no wasted punches. We're not throwing jabs just to throw a jab. There's everything is with intent. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of credit there and point out that there's so much more that people don't see the average fan. And even the average trainer probably isn't seeing half of the stuff that I think someone like you is seeing. Right, so anyway, credit where credit is due. Here, you get a ball. <laughs> you get a ball for Very that. Very kind I, of you. I, 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 you didn't get to the level to get money yet. But you get this. You get this. All right, Grasshopper. Soon you will be allowed to leave this place. That's another one. The Kung Fu. You remember that with David Carradine? Yep. Oh, that was great. Grasshopper, when you can remove the pellet from my hand, you can leave this place. Uh, so, to your point, what I was seeing was this is what I saw. And this is why I have great admiration. And I want to make sure that I give it to him. I want to give somebody who's special their due. So I want to make sure that I do it properly. Crawford is special. Yeah, he uh, he showed, he made mistakes. Got a little over anxious, walked into, got a little over aggressive, walked into a few counters. Sometimes he jabs, whether it's southpaw or orthodox, he can do it. He, and I'll tell you another thing, he's, he's the greatest switch hitter I've ever seen in boxing. I'll say it again. Yeah, I said it. I, I think he's the most instinctual fighter I've ever seen. And he's also the greatest switch hitter I've ever seen. There's been good one. Andre was a good one. There's been good ones. But I've never seen one that was like Mickey Mantle in baseball. That could hit with power from either side of the plate at average. And not miss anything. But left or righty. And he can do it. He can do it. When he goes, I notice that. When Crawford goes orthodox, he's in his aggressive mode. When he goes southpaw, he's in his boxing mode. He's controlling range. He's looking to set traps a little more. He'll press off that, but he's thinking more cerebrally a little bit. And he sometimes he'd throw the jab from a little too close instead of getting full extension on that great jab. He's got a great jab when he uses it properly where – it's long, it's snappy, it's everything. And he sometimes throws it from too close where it could be counted. And sometimes his hand placement's a little off, where it comes a little low. Where if he gets caught, he could get caught clean instead of catching it on the glove. And that's what some great fighters do because they have such great reflexes, such great eyes, such great vision. They usually get away with it. So they might get a little lax in those areas. And he does in spots and the other thing is sometimes he'll step out from a little too close where if you follow him you can catch him instead of stepping out from the proper range where controlling that range mm -hmm. but just when that happens he's got the backup of supreme confidence very few fighters have that complete belief you can't beat me and I will go to hell and back and back and forth before you beat me because you're not beating me. He's got that great in, ingredient that's, that, that very few people have in anything they do, anything. That great supreme confidence, that's the sim simplest way of me putting it forward. And he's got a great chin. Oh, I'd say. No, uh, the great he ones have it. You know, whether punches. it was Ali, whether it was Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, you know, uh, Kid Gavilan, what a chin he had. But uh, he had the bolo punch too. But he, he's he got all these things to back up when he's a little off. He, he was a little off for the reasons I said, whatever you want to say. Maybe he was a little 
contentious. He was a little uh, cocky, thinking, you know, I'll just go get And he walked into a little, but he's got the special gifts to back it up. The specialness that the great ones have mm-hmm. to back it up. And when I was watching it, to your point, where other people were panicking and saying, oh, oh, wait, wait, oh, oh, and I get it. I get it. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, again, a movie. I was thinking about, uh-oh, this is Bruce Banner and the Hulk, <laughs> and they just pissed off Bruce Banner. <laughs> you don't piss off Bruce Banner. You don't upset Bruce Banner because when Bruce Banner gets upset, he starts to change and he starts to get green and he starts to grow and he becomes the Hulk. And I was watching it and that's exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking, I even text Rob. I said, get some stuff to show the Hulk. Get some stuff for tomorrow to show the Hulk. He is a mean bastard when he gets angry. I said, oh, Kavalaskas, me machine, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to hit the guy. I get it. You're supposed to. But nah, not with this guy. Me because machine turned Crawford mean. You, Guy's you got just, a mean streak you, like you no just, one. You just pissed off. You don't get Bruce Banner upset. Because next thing you know, you got a green, ugly guy in front of you. <laughs> and it's not and, the Grinch. No, no. <laughs> you know, and it's fitting because he's got... Pit bull in him, oh, and I and I find it's fitting that he raises pit bull dogs. Did you know that yeah, about yeah, Crawford? Yeah. Yep. It's fitting because it's like he understands their temperaments. Like he You're shares right. that, and I'm being as complimentary as I can. That's how special this guy is to me. That's that, right. It's like a pit bull with a family. You're like, what a beautiful looking dog. Oh, but then you forget when he's with the kids and not loving. You forget he's still a pit bull. He's a pit bull. If someone comes to the door and doesn't want him there, he's gonna like bite their leg off. Yeah, or more. Yeah. <laughs> But that's what and, and, I like about Crawford. He gets mean, where he's like not angry, and, and the not special reckless. ones. He's the just, special ones had it. Sugar Ray Leonard had it. Oh yeah, a lot of people don't realize that smile was seven up commercials. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> get do something to him in that ring. And do you remember when the guy from Boston knocked him down in uh, Boston? The great Dickie Eklund made yeah. made Ray very angry though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I mean, the special ones, you know, yeah. had that Sugar Ray Robinson, the original Sugar Ray. Yeah. You know, he he had it. You know, and um, the, this is Roberto Duran as a lightweight, as a lightweight, yeah. as a great, great, great lightweight. He had it. He had it. The Jesus, who was a tremendous fighter, uh, Jesus, uh, the Jesus, uh, the Jesus, um, he was a first guy to beat Duran. Mm-hmm. Fought him twice, and twice or three times, I think twice. And first time, first guy to beat him, and he dropped Duran. And he, boy, you make Duran mad. He came back. Duran came back outdoors in Panama and beat him. And you know, he just he had that too. He had that too. I remember that fight where, uh, of course, they played it. You know, the the network wanted to play up on all the drama and all the little. You know, and the Jesus gets dropped to Duran's right over, and the Jesus crawl into the ropes. Say, look at their head. He made him crawl. <laughs> you know, because it's the legend, you know. But Crawford, Crawford has those special qualities and uh, they were on display. And I appreciate it. But a lot of people, again, I don't have to defend Crawford. I, I don't, but I want people to get their due. And a lot of people are going to say, oh, gee, he was wide with a punch. And, and, you know, he walked into this and he got, he, listen. He showed everything. He showed the ability to set traps. He showed the ability uh, to do smart things, to do, to go downstairs, to go upstairs, to everything, to throw the punches at the right time, the right punches, to uppercut at the right time, the vision for all those things. But he also showed inside of himself what only the real special ones have. Yeah, he got stubborn. He got almost mad. But the great ones, they don't get mad. But it, it's, it's more of a like, how dare you? That's what I felt it's watching like, him. How dare you? Like, not mad, like a stubbornness, but but a greatness to the stubbornness. Because, because they are emotional. That is part of what makes us human beings and makes us where we can be special. Is that we care. He cares about how he looks. He cares. Yes. The pride. The all of that. He cares about what what 
what is going on. It's not about the paycheck. It's not about how many paychecks you already cashed, how many titles you already won. No, it's about that moment, who I am. And he, it all came out. And you could see that watching him. Soon as, as soon as, um, how dare you? Mean Machine uh, would land. He'd almost, Crawford would almost get a look on him like, son of a bitch. Oh, I'm going to get you now. <laughs> Well, there's a ton of subplots around that. I think we've done a good job of discussing what happened in the fight. But more than anything, I think um, people are dying to see what's next. And before we get into what's next, I noticed that um, after the fight, I don't know what's going on with Tim Bradley. He's kind of taken on this villain slash heel role at ESPN. And it to me, it just doesn't work for him. I mean, he seems like a nice enough guy outside of the uh, camera studio, but... After the fight, he basically went on a little rant against the PBC and said the only man over there is uh, Deontay, Wild, um, uh, Deontay Wilder because he's willing to fight Tyson Fury, who coincidentally happens to be with ESPN in top rank. But to suggest that the guys over there, especially in the division, are less than a, a man or whatever the hell terminology he used, I was just kind of like, Tim, what are you talking about? This is There's a business involved, too. It's not just like... These guys are all standing in a bar and no one wants to go outside and fight Crawford. I think Crawford wants to fight them. And I think the great ones at PBC want to fight, want to fight Crawford. But to suggest that they're not a man, almost like shilling for ESPN and top rank. Like, dude, get a grip, commentate on the fights. You can have an opinion, but taking on this aggressive role. And, and again, it's almost like having spent so much time with you. I look at him and I listen and I'm like, this is a bad interpretation of Teddy's words used out of context. Your phrases and terminology, but used in the complete wrong context, the complete wrong connotation. And it's just like, dude, stop trying so hard. He's not bad on the microphone, but when he starts acting like that, rah, rah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the angry, I'm like Teddy Atlas, but completely like, like making a mess of it. I don't get it. I don't understand that. And, and, and to call out the guys at PBC, like, come on, man. It's just, it's not working for him. And I think that the blowback on Twitter has been ruthless, needless to say. But um, I just wanted to point that out. It's like, I like the, I liked those, I like the analogies when they're used by the originator. I don't like when someone like um, hijacks another guy's material and tries to make it their own. And, you know, look, there's, there's a certain amount of that you're going to get from spending so much time with someone like he did with you. You're going to pick up certain, you know, phrases and terminology which is fine but exercise a little discretion it shouldn't be an exact regurgitation of something you heard from someone else at the very least can you at least give a footnote like as teddy atlas once said because they're exact same phrases that you use here i've seen you use in camp and i know you've used with him i wasn't there but i know from being around you that that's the way you, those are your that's your material a, a comic wouldn't get on stage and use someone else's material without at least acknowledging so and so said this. Anyway, I don't want to get too deep I, in that. I, I said what I had it. to say. Listen, some people say the greatest form of flattery is imitation. Yeah. Right. Well, so then you should be incredibly flattered. So I mean, um, and again, I like Tim Bradley. I hate I, to sound like a jerk, but Jesus, and he, and he's tone a, it down. And he is a good person. He is. I've, I've spoken to him off, off, uh, outside of the uh, boxing arena, and he's he is a good guy. But dude. Stop that. It keep it's seeming like he's on a roll. It keeps getting a little bit more aggressive every week or every couple of months. It's like, dude, you don't have to play that role unless someone in, in production is telling him, Tim, get out there and uh play a role, play a play a character. That doesn't work. Um, what do you think's next for Crawford? Uh one quick thing I did see is that Aram gave an interview this week, um, I think with Keith Eidek at a boxing scene where he said he's been speaking to Al, they could make the fight with Spence in an hour, which, by the way, is funny, given that sometime this past year, he said to of Al Heyman, Al Heyman is afraid to put his guys in. He doesn't want to lose to me, and basically on a little rant against Al. Now he comes out this week with a <laughs> quote saying, yeah, Al and I had a conversation. We could make this fight in an hour. Spence is hurt. We don't know how bad. No one's seen any. He, he released one picture since he was thrown out of a Ferrari going 100 miles an hour with no seatbelt on. You don't know if this kid has a bad neck, a bad back. I hope he's okay. I hope he's good. And you don't know how he is mentally and no, emotionally there's a million, seeing your life pass in front of you. Million think plus, about it. I know. You're going to get back in the ring after seeing your life and think nothing of it? No, you're going to think something of it. More than that, we have now... 
Bob Aram saying, no, yeah, we're ready for him now. Like, come on, man. The kid just went through like a, a life and death experience. And again, it's not just the physical component exactly. of it. You don't know where he is emotionally. I'm sure I'm sure that they do want to make the fight now. But And he says that they, they have been talking about it prior to the accident, that they were going to do the fight in 2020. The fact that we haven't seen or heard anything from Spence since this happened is not a good sign. Unless they're... You know, they have some master plan to be go go dark on everyone, but I don't think it's good. And and I hope he gets back. I love Spence. I think that him and Crawford are like one A, one B. I I that that's as close for me as a fifty fifty fight prior to the accident. Well, hope first, he's okay, but curious to hear what I, you think. Oh no, well listen, the first thing is what you were talking about with Bradley saying, you know, first of all he's friendly with Crawford. So he he's backing up his friend. I, I, no, I'm just saying. I no, know you're fine. in a professional place. I get it, and and you got to be non-biased. But he, uh, I mean, we back up our friends sometimes, and he. Uh, so part of it, he's got a close relationship with Crawford. He was backing him up. But you can be friends with somebody. You're going to tell me Porter, no, but, Thurman, but here's those the guys thing. aren't men. But no, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. He was trying to be dramatic, but here's the thing, and get a point across and stand out with that point. But in all fairness, it's not it's not just on the people on PPC, um, their responsibility to make the fight. It's people on the other side of the street too. You know, I mean, it, what's good for the goose is good for the ganta. You, you got to be fair about it. In other words, if you're going to say, hey, come on, you know, come on, you guys over at PPC, you know, come over here and fight Crawford. Now, let's stop the nonsense. Well, you you also got to say, hey, you guys over at top rank, you, you got to be fair about this. 100%. Uh, you, you can't, you got to say, hey, come over here. <laughs> you know, you can't just say, hey, you come over here. to my, No, you come over here. No, you come over here. No, you come. It gets silly. Here's an easy I, way. I, Spence Crawford's 50-50. Split the purse yeah, down the middle. But, put but it I'm on just joint, saying it takes, it takes both, it's both sides. Yep. You know, top rank side, they don't want to give up control. I mean, they don't want to cross the street and give up control. They want to fight guys that they have options on, guys that they control. So you're limited. You're, you're limited now to who you can fight because they only have the guys they have in their promotional stable. And most they beat of the, them all now. Most of the best welterweights are in the PPC yep. stable. It's a fact. Yep. So you, you can't just say, no, both sides got to figure it out. Both sides got I will say this. It'll be a shame. It will be a shame, and it won't be the first time it's been a shame in boxing. It won't. But it'll be the shame if Crawford doesn't get a chance to do what Sugar Ray Leonard did and fight special guys out there to bring out the greatness in them. Sugar Ray Leonard got to fight Tommy Hearns and Roberto Duran and and Marvin Hagler, Wilfredo Benitez, those fights, brought, that's the reason why I consider Sugar Ray Leonard one of the greats of any era. Mm -hmm. That's why we're talking about him right now. Because he had those fights, those marquee fights with Hearns and with Duran and with Hagel, where he could show his greatness. It would be a shame. Because part of how we rate Leonard... His greatness is because of what he did in those fights, those those epic fights with those great fighters. It would be a shame if we don't see Crawford show, get a chance to show his true greatness with the best fighters. That would be a shame. It would be. And right now it's not going to happen because he's... He's on the wrong side of the street. He's not on the side of the street with the promoter that has those fighters. Yep. So something has to give. And first thing that has to give, it's got to be a financially big enough fight for both sides to come together to say, okay, now we can start talking about it. We can figure it out. Because when Don King and Aaron could work together, anyone could work together. <laughs> you know, and yeah. because when there was money involved. And, of course, you had Pacquiao and Mayweather for astronomical, crazy, 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 uh, life-altering numbers. That well, they're nobody, working together on the Wilder uh, Fury fight. And, and like, the only reason this. that fight happened was because it became so big. Yep. The both sides, both networks, both promoters had to come together, make concessions to come together. And it can be done. But again, the stakes have to be there for them to want to do it. Uh, but uh, again, that would be 
It's a little bit, I don't know if it's too powerful a word to say travesty, but it would be a damn shame. Oh, I would say that would be a travesty for not, the world's away not, division. Not, not, not to see, you know, not to see Crawford's true, get a chance to really, really see his true greatness with the best, yeah. with the very best. And, um, and for Spence, same thing. If you can go in there and beat Crawford, I, to me, you'll want your number one. You're with Lomachenko, and that's it. And it's separating from the crowd. The winner of that fight, Spence, uh, Spence and Crawford, for me. So I, I hope it gets done, and I do think it would be a travesty if it doesn't get made. Again, assuming that Spence is okay, and we obviously hope he he is okay. I, he's super nice. But don't guy forget, and, don't forget. Like I know, I'm repeating myself now, but. The physical part, you know, they say of he course. lost teeth and, and he lost his teeth, but it was a miracle. He, he should be really thanking God. Teddy. And I don't tell anyone, to, wait, I don't tell anyone how to behave their life, but he should be thanking God that he's alive. Really. 100%. And thank God. And I'm thanking God he's alive. Same but, here. but you know, he lost his teeth. He got a few abrasions, but minimal. I mean, really think about it. What could have been, but you can't dismiss. The emotional impact of of what we're talking about that this guy saw his life pass in front of him. He might not be ready to get back. I'm not saying I know anything. I know. Right. But I know what I know what being a human being means. <laughs> and and he he may be saying, gee, let me think about it. my life was given back to me. My life was given let me think about what I'm doing next. The thought of missing teeth to being thrown from a Ferrari going hundred miles an hour and everyone's seen the video, like that would be a that would be like the greatest gift you could receive. Oh, all I lost was my teeth when I probably should be dead. That was that was as scary a crash as you can see. Anyway, hope he's okay. Looking forward to seeing him back in action. Hope that fight can be made. Before we carry on, I want to talk to you about um, Tyson Fury's getting uh, talking about getting rid of his trainer. But before I do, I want to remind everyone that today's episode is sponsored by Teddy's uh, audiobook, Atlas from the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Struggle to Become a Man. Written by the great Teddy Atlas. Here's a copy of the um, of the 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 written book and the audio books available on Amazon.com, Audible.com. Please check it out. There's a ton of information and new material in the audio book that's not included in the published version. So um, it's a great book. If you're a fan of Teddy, like you won't be able to put it down. I promise. That's not me uh, blowing smoke up anyone's butt. This is an awesome book, and once you start it, it's hard to stop reading until you get to the end. So Kudos to Teddy, and please check it out. Thanks again for all the support. And if you want to clear a room out and you want to get some people that are hanging around, maybe your wife invited them over and you know you want to be polite and you really want to get rid of them, just put it on. Just put it on the room, you know. Uh, put the volume up a little. And, oh! and then they'll they all run away. And then you clear the room out and you don't have to have an argument with your wife. Good point. Hey, um, Tyson Fury News today, I saw... Um, He's talking about, I don't know if it's official, that he's getting rid of his trainer, Ben Davison, who's been with him throughout his comeback. Ben Davison, I think he's only about 26 years old. And Tyson Fury himself had said when he was coming back that he uh, needed a friend more than he needed a trainer. Which like is a soulmate, uh, like yeah. a life coach. Yep. And I think after the uh, Wallen performance, and you know, credit to Wallen, he put on a good show. Uh, Fury has decided he needs a more experienced trainer, presumably, and he's talking to some much more experienced guys. Um, one of the people that he did work with when he was with Ben is he had some help from um, Freddie Roach, but he's come out and said Freddie Roach won't be the trainer. But it'll be interesting to see um, where he goes with this, to be honest with you. I think that he probably should call you, Teddy, but that's my, just my opinion. Um, be interesting. I, I, I have, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, um, I appreciate it. I do. I appreciate you thinking of me and Karen and and your beliefs and all that. I, I do. And what you said earlier and all that, it, it, it means a lot. But I'm, I'm like uh, Tom and the Godfather, uh, Tom Hagen. Mm. You know, when, consigliere. Yeah, consigliere to uh, Don Corleone. I, I'm like him when, uh, when he went to uh, Hollywood to talk to that big uh, time producer to get a to get a uh to get a a part in a movie for johnny love for johnny fontaine yeah. who really was supposed to be frank sinatra and he went there and you know to get a part for him and uh and he went to his studio to see to see the big producer the big shot producer to talk to him uh, about getting a part for johnny fontaine and he gives him his card and he you know because the producer got you know a little 
pushy with him and said, get out of here. You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know you. And, <laughs> you know, you come in here. And so he left his card. He said, here, look, I'm going to be in the hotel for the night. You know, give, give me a call if, if, if you decide to give me a call. And then he calls him and invites him over. And uh, before, but oh, before he did that, he says, I know all the big shot lawyers. I know them all in town. How come I never? How come I never heard of you? <laughs> he says I only have one client, <laughs> and that's that's how I kind of feel. I have yeah. Alex Vozik, and I have one client. I only have one client. Oh, I know how you operate. I'm just saying, from an outside observer, he'd do well to speak to someone like yourself and get some uh, input. And it's worth. I don't know. If it were me, that's what I would be trying to do: is get someone who, if you're not looking for a friend and you're looking to be all business, Teddy's your guy. <laughs> there is nothing nice about trying to win a fight. There is no place there for um, being friends when it's time to do something so serious as get in the ring, especially a heavyweight title fight. Nevertheless, um, it'll be interesting to see which direction he goes because I think that um, that is a factor, right? When, I think people underestimate how significant the trainer is in a big fight like that and how you can make adjustments and how you need to make adjustments just like a football game. Look at Bill Belichick. I mean, there's been times where he's been, they've had far less talent than everyone else. And you see them go in and no one's better at calling a game than Tony Romo. And Tony Romo, even during the Chiefs, the Patriots almost came back and won that game last week. And Tony Romo, one single play and Tony Romo goes, oh, they've got it. Look, they've got to figure it figured out. Watch when Welker goes in motion. They double down on him. Watch for this. Watch for that. And boom, the Patriots start coming back. They lose the game on the last play of the game. At one point, they were getting blown out. The referees. But that, my point with that is with a trainer, especially in a boxing match, when the, when your game plan's not working out, who's going to be, you don't need a friend. You need a, you need a coach who's in there telling you, dude, look, at every time you do this, he's doing that. We need to change this up, move around here, take looks when you're punching, don't come back to the center, finish on the angle, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd be curious to see what um, Fury does and if he can make a few adjustments because one or two small adjustments and he's the heavyweight champ and Wilder's out of the picture in that last fight. Just don't get hit with that right now. That's hand. it. That's it. But that's where the right trainer is going to help him avoid getting hit with that hand. Because he can clearly outbox him. He As was Ortiz did. He yeah. was doing it. As Ortiz did. So it'll be interesting um, to see. But, um, not but you got, again, I'll finish up with the importance and how severe that right hand is. You know, with using this story. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I know you love my story. <laughs> love it, I Thank you. And it's kind of like... You know, you can be winning, like you just said it. You said he was winning, he was outboxing him, right? It's kind of like that guy who jumps off the Empire State Building, right? And he's going down, and around the 50th floor, you know, he's going past the window, and the people are looking out the window, looking at him, and he's going past, and he goes, how, how am I doing? And, <laughs> and he's, good so far. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's you know you you're in there with you're in there with wild. How am I doing? Good so far, but that concrete's <laughs> coming. You know what I mean? That concrete's coming fast. It's coming, and you better find a way to get a parachute or something before it hits you. Yeah. Well, listen, um, we probably won't get another episode this year um, unless we sneak one in in the next two weeks. I know we got one more fight this year, Charlo and uh, Harrison, which I'm actually really looking forward to that one. And, and that one was the one I went to the defense of Harrison. Harrison I don't know yeah. if you remember because he won that fight and everybody was all over. Oh, he got robbed. He got No, he didn't get robbed. He outboxed yeah. Charlo. Yeah. So the one thing I want to say about those guys, the Charlo brothers, is these two kids could be the most marketable guys in boxing. They are like, they're like Hollywood good looking. They're good fighters, but they play this thug gangster thing. And, and my buddy Regis Progray, who I love, is close with these guys. And I've said to him more than once, like, I don't get this gangster thug mentality. You're a prize fighter. You're going to fight for money in front of millions of people. Why do you have to act like a tough guy outside of the ring? Why not just be a gentleman? Like, hey, I'm going to show you how tough I am while everyone in the world is watching, which takes guts that you, immeasurable. So, but they, they put themselves out there as these like bad guys. And I just don't get it. Why be the villain when you don't have to, to market yourself? They have so many positive attributes and, 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 and qualities. So. I gotta be honest, I'm, I'm kind of in the Harrison corner just because I can't stand these guys always talking trash and putting on this gangster thug. I, don't, I haven't attitude. seen all that. I haven't seen those dimensions so much. But I don't watch 
Maybe I don't watch as much, but I I know Harrison and um I know I know Charlo's more physical, mm. but Harrison box magnificent, mm -hmm. magnificent, um in every way you can box magnificent in that ring. And he was another great example. You don't have to be the most physical guy yeah. or the stronger physical guy um, to win in that ring. Yeah. And he won. And then, you know, for people to um, to go after him and say he didn't win, and I, it was terrible. He The judges got it right. I give credit. I hope the judges are not influenced now, intimidated now, to go the other way now. That if he gives the same performance and gets the same things done, give it to him. I, I think it might be different this time. I do. I think it's going to be maybe more difficult this time. And um, and um, but I also have what I always have a concern about the judges. Yeah. Just being right and being fair, being not corrupt, you know, and and being competent, you know, not not just who's walking forward. I mean, that doesn't win a fight for you. You have to be doing things walking forward. You have to be, you know, it's that old saying. Yeah, I'm aggressive, but am I effective? While I'm aggressive, it's effective aggression. It's not just aggression. Yep. You know, and and a guy, I mean, Ali, Pernell Whitaker. I mean, all these great fighters. What are we supposed to erase them from history that they didn't walk forward, but they won all these fights because they they box. They all that matters is that you're controlling what has to be controlled. You're hitting the other guy more than he's hitting you. However, you're doing it. You're outsmarting him. You're tricking them. You're setting traps. Whatever, or you're coming forward. Whatever way you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And Harrison did it his way. You know, box brilliant and would not fight. And I again, it'll be probably tougher the second time because in some ways he put as fine or as good a performance as he could have. A little bit, I'm just jumping ahead, but a little bit the way I would look at the Fury, and we'll do more of it, of course, mm -hmm. when it gets closer. But a little bit, a preview of what I'm thinking, just touching on it, of Fury and Wilder in the rematch. For me, it's going to be hard. Fury couldn't have boxed better, mm -hmm. except for those two mistakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so Teddy, he could box better. Oh, okay, I got you. But he... In some ways, he couldn't have done more than he did that night. Yeah. So it's going to be hard for him. Wilder could do more. Wilder, mm -hmm. there are so many more things. If if uh, maybe he can't learn no more. Maybe he's gotten to a point where he's not learning it. But there is more room for Wilder to get better. Uh, Fury just has to not make a mistake. But he couldn't do much more than he did that night. So yeah. in some ways, I would favor Wilder. I I don't make I'm not making my pick now. Yeah. But I would favor Wilder in that way, um, that he can have a better performance. And in some ways, that might be a hindrance to to Harrison that he can't get much better than he was that night, you know. And uh, and and Charlo can. Yeah. Charlo can can learn from it, can improve, or at least theoretically, he's supposed to be able to get better. So that's how I kind of look. Well, I like the way Harrison's been handling handling himself in the press conferences too, because the Charlos try to go with that, like I said, thug, gangster, bully type mentality. Even in the pressers, and Harrison, he's just not having it. I love his comebacks. He's supremely confident. He's like, dude, you're not going to intimidate me. We're going to fight for money. Don't what you say and do up here is all theatrics, and he's just kind of dismissive of him, which almost seems to further enrage Charlo. Nevertheless, looking forward to that one. But if we don't get to get to uh, record another episode before the end of the year, just want to say thank you to everyone who's listened. This has been an incredible experience. The just on YouTube alone, we're up over six million views now. Thank you to everyone who leaves comments. Sincerely, like we, I read a lot of them. I try to respond to the people, at least the ones that say nice stuff to me. <laughs> the negative ones, if I disagree, I'll try to respond to those as well. But if you're just calling me a jerk, I typically ignore those. But um, don't call me a jerk. Please. In all sincerity, thank you for everything. It's been a great. It's been a great year. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you to our man, Rob. One of these days, we'll get him on camera. And if anyone says he looks like my son, I will punch you in the mouth. Do not tell me he looks like my son. He's my friend. He's just a few years younger than me. But uh, and honestly, he's also a great runner in his own right, just best. like you are. Three-time uh, Ironman Hawaii competitor. Unbelievable sub-nine-hour Ironman in uh, Mexico. He's the real deal. Thank you to all the sponsors we've had this year. Athletic Greens, 10,000 uh, on it. Rob, who am I missing? 
My bookie, the big one, Teddy's audio book. There's been some great ones. Seriously, we appreciate everything. Guys, if you could do us one favor for Christmas gifts for the show, please leave us a review on Apple iTunes. A positive review goes a long way, honestly. It helps us in the, uh, whatever metrics or algorithms they use to get the show up there. And, um, you know, the better the numbers, the better, the better the reviews, the more content we can bring you. This isn't easy. I live in LA. Teddy lives in Staten Island, which from New York might as well be in Maine. Um, it ain't easy to get here. We're in our new studio in New York. So we're like, we're doing our best to give you the best content, to deliver the best content we can. So, Sincerely, thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everyone. Teddy, thank you for letting me do this with you. I really appreciate it. It's been like one of the most fun projects I've ever been involved with in my life. Um, you got anything to say before we end the year? Uh, thank you. And uh, thank Rob, as you just said. Thank my family. Uh, and thank you guys. Without you, there's no reason to do this. Thank you for caring. Caring about what we do and what we say. And um Understanding that we're we're trying to we're trying to trying to do something that's fun for us, enjoy it while we're doing it, but at the same time understanding responsibility behind it. You know, to put light, as I jokingly but seriously say, put light on proper things that sometimes need a light put on. Proper yeah. things. And uh thank you guys for being with us. All right, guys, with that Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thanks again. We'll see you guys early next year.